Uh, it's good to see so many people here for the first of our housing seminars. Uh, of course, Exchange are doing a series of these. I think we're moving quite a lot into housing and planning. It's an issue we started last year. I think we're going to be continuing for the rest of this year at least. Um, if I could also remind you to, to turn your phones off, because there's nothing more uh, off putting having spoken to these things than, than someone's phone going off. Um, I'll start by having a quick sort of skim through the private rent sector, what's happened in the past 20 years or so, before I turn over to our, our speakers. Um, first thing I think is the, the big change in 1988, a short, 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 short tenancy was introduced, which is basically, I think, a good point to start where we've got to today. We then had the expansion of the mortgage market uh, and price rise at the beginning of the mid-90s. Yields that have not been huge, but have been enough to attract quite a few uh, investors, often small investors. There's been a very large expansion in the private rented sector, about half since the early 90s. Um, some people have argued that this is part of the tax deductions, so interest on mortgage you know, and maintenance costs. Other people say it's a change that uh, people are living as single households, younger, uh, living with friends, uh, it's just reflecting a, a social dynamic. Uh, they tend to be happier than social tenants, quite substantially so. They also tend, however, to be uh, quite substantially less happy than the owner occupiers. Again, there's a question, is that just due to the group, uh, or is it something inherent in, in tenure types? And finally, there's a question around wealth inequality versus flexibility. So a positive argument about the private sector is that it's more flexible. Uh, a negative one is that you get uh, groups and families building up uh, wealth that then passes down, which some people are excluded from. Uh, so we thought this was a good time to, to revisit the whole issue of the private rental sector and some of the debates that are going on today. We've got build to let versus buy to let, which to some extent breaks down to an institutional versus individual uh, debate. Uh, what framework are we going to have in the private rental sector? What could we do to improve satisfaction, e.g. secure more secure tenancies? Uh, or is that something that people don't want? Or if they do want, would actually damage the sector by reducing supply? Uh, we have some questions around how the private rented sector fits with home ownership. Most people want to own their own homes at some point in their lives, about 85 to 90%, uh, which is quite a high portion, at some point want to own. And then finally, there's a question about uh, is there an image problem with the private rented sector? A few people see it as, as, as neither as secure as social tenancies, but neither desirable as occupation, uh, or is this a <coughs> um, I think one person thinks that there is a slight problem with, with the image of it uh, and has some ideas about how to solve that. Uh, it's Roger Scholar, she will be speak first. Well, like Nicholas Guerin from Berg, we uh, <coughs> Matt Bricks from Price Down, and then Adam Moore from the Residential Land Association. So we start with Roger. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I, I'll start here with this, uh, with this slide. Uh, effectively, this is uh, the position that we have, which we believe that housing uh, is a consumer product, should remain a consumer product, and in a way that consumer product <coughs> is being slightly denied by the marketplace. And we believe the reason it's being denied by the marketplace is because when you come to buy a property, you're more concerned about its investment than you are about its consumer qualities, i.e. what it's doing for you as an individual. So unlike buying a car or buying a Hoover or buying a regular consumer product where you're just ensuring that you want to get the best <coughs> the best comparable, the best quality product, when we buy a home, we're muddling up two different criteria. One, <coughs> does it suit our lifestyle? Is it a place we want to live? But also, is it a good investment? <coughs> And uh, these statistics, uh, I think, are now sort of quite clear to us that uh, on the top hand, uh, on the top uh, graph, you're seeing the amount of mortgage, uh, the, the fall off in mortgage, <coughs> new mortgages, and on the bottom graph, you're seeing the fall off in housing completions. Now, that fall off in, in mortgages, uh, in a way, is fueled by the inflation of house price. Inflation of house price, uh, which is kind of, in a way, sort of shown quite uh, crudely here, but I think quite simply, in the sense of saying, uh, if a house had been a price of milk, it would now be 10 quid a, uh, a litre. If it had been a piece of beef, it would be 100 quid. 
And, and I think that the kind of words inflation <coughs> and house price are never really kind of used. They're a little bit of a kind of private myth that we actually don't kind of expose. <coughs> and what that's done is it's made a lot of housing completely unaffordable. And therefore, the mortgage collapse or the, or the shortage of mortgages is because uh, mortgage companies, uh, uh, early societies, have always relied uh, not on their security, but more rely on their ability for you to repay that loan. <coughs> and therefore, what early societies are doing are replacing <coughs> the long-term trend, which is your multiple of earnings relative to the amount of loan that you have. And the, whereas they recognized previously that there was a kind of escalating inflator, therefore that, that security wasn't as important to them because they always felt they could get out. And that really has kind of changed the nature of the world. <coughs> And if we look across in other places of the world, we see a very interesting correlation. And that relation is to do with different countries where there is a much lower level of house ownership relative to their GDP. And uh, strangely, it's the inverse of what you expect. So that the higher, uh, Spain is the highest on the right with a, with a home ownership of about 75% is in fact got the lowest GDP of anywhere in Europe, where Switzerland has got the lowest level of home ownership of about 28 or 30% and the GDP. And if we think about it, actually what it really means is that uh, if there's a genuine market in terms of renting, why is there a necessity to invest all that money in a capital asset if the capital asset itself is not the only mechanism that is actually increasing uh, your wealth? And I think what's interesting in, in this uh, um, study here, and I see Yolanda at the back, so I'd like to thank her for her uh, excellent research, from established research. And I, I, I think uh, she may have a different view, but I think what this is kind of demonstrated here is the fact that there, in, the, in, in Savile's assessment of the prime indices for quarter four 2010, the growth is on the rental, not on the capital. Now that may be something that's out of alignment, but if that goes on to be the case, then in reality we end up, coming back to Alex's point, we end up with an opportunity for people probably to both own their asset, but the asset they may own would be an accommodation which they then let. So you're actually now recreating the idea of an investment material, and that investment material is now coming round to the thing of saying that the buy to let market is actually a genuine part of marketplace and if people are wanting to invest in their housing they invest in that asset which then which then follows uh, <coughs> growth and I think that is also shown by two other aspects of this which is one the top uh, graph there is demonstrating the pipeline of planning applications in other words you're seeing them fall off in terms of consents and so the scarcity of the housing supply is going on building up and obviously localism is now beginning to come into that picture and going to continue that. I don't see any prospect of an increase in that housing. And then on the bottom slide, we're saying that the, what is the long-term trend? And we see that the house ownership line has now <coughs> overtaken the, the uh, rental line. Now, this, at this stage, I'm saying that this is where I believe that uh, if you are talking about the long-term trend, towards rental, then you now start to need to end up with product being more important than process. And I believe that what we've looked at in the kind of housing market really for almost for the last, certainly the decade if not the last two decades, is that process has become dominant and product has fallen away. That's not to say process is not going to exist. And if you go to Japan where Japan um, actually generates 1.2 million new homes every year. And one of the people that are supplied uh, <coughs> as other suppliers are in fact a, a consumer, um, a, a brand, and this brand in this case is Muji. So Muji, the same Muji that you go buy your stationery from, that we all kind of enjoy as a kind of brand, actually in Japan uh, operates a kind of branded uh, house. And I think that this is, this is a recognition that we've forgotten, coming back to the process of product, to, to remember that lifestyle, which we see all around us, is actually the thing that makes up our enjoyment of the home. 
And I think that it's quite interesting in this slide, this is this, some of my architecture friends might, might find some distaste with this, uh, this slide. Uh, I think it actually is a very interesting slide because it really represents people's notion of taste as to what they aspire to. And what's interesting about this kind of, this is a self-built slide. I, this is uh, a couple that have, have put all their resources together and began to uh, build their dream. And I think that they're, they're in the image of that dream is something that, that maybe is, is rural and is spacious and is very large. And of course, when we are in an urban situation, we actually have a different type of intensity. And we're now trying to find ways of intensifying and making spacious much tighter spaces. And so here are these spaces where we're actually using <coughs> the third dimension. And what's interesting about the bottom of the slide is that we look at the, this, the point that I'm making about uh, owning to let is that the mortgage, the one part of the mortgage market that has expanded in 2010 and grew by 7% is the mortgage for buy to let. And I think that it became, it was quite, for me, I, I, I did some research on this and I was surprised to find that by now, 12% of the entire mortgage market is in fact in buy to let. And we must rem remember that at the buy to let as a mortgage market really didn't, it only started about a decade ago. Now we at Solid Space, which is my company actually that makes a kind of uh, uh, these, these rather intense and three dimensions, which is started off with a, with a, uh, a building which isn't very far from here, but it is across the water in Waterloo. Uh, and, and this was the idea that you operate a split level accommodation and therefore try to start to build a brand around that idea. And here the, the, the idea is explained more, uh, which is what the, the, the DNA of our brand for 21st century living is the idea that there are three spaces at the heart of the home, the three social spaces which are live, work, and eat. And in the way in which we conduct our families, the way in which we kind of uh, help our children get through their education, deal with our elderly parents, deal with all the kind of realities of life, we need these kind of spaces which are social spaces which interlock and actually give us a sort of sense of spaces in the middle of it. Uh, and I think that is what meets our 21st century lifestyle. And then here it, it is an extension of that, uh, showing the adaptability of that product and the way in which that product itself can then adapt to uh, give, give a grandparent accommodation. It can adapt us to what's sometimes known in a third world economy as the dollar room, i.e. the ability for you to even be able to sublet another space while you move into it. So it gives you this flexibility that you can achieve by going up and down the um, spaces. Uh, this is just a, a, a demonstration of a different type of urban strategy. Which Roger, is, as the chair's probably trying to ask, speed up a little yep, bit. Yes, I think, uh, so I think we're on the last couple the of speed. slides. This is how it's made out of a bit parts. And this is, in a way, just a, a, an explanation of, of what it is that we've made there. Um, this is <coughs> something called the Salt House, which is made out of a prefabricated. So there's an idea that this brand should be a brand with solid space inside. Mm -hmm. And it's a mechanism that we can actually manufacture and I'll say, uh, I think that's it. So I think uh, very interesting idea there around branding and we have an example of uh, Roger's particular brand for the solid space uh, living um, there. Uh, I think the only thing I might question that the, uh, the NIMBY and SCS is my question. I don't think the Minister and Silver are don't believe that the NIMBY that the local agenda will create NIMBY and I don't think that's what they're going for. Maybe we of course they're wrong but I think, I think their aim is to try and expand the housing supply over the long term. Yes, I think we can do that. Yes. I think we're hopeful we'll be having some later seminars to discuss how, if they want to do that, how they might best do it. Um, but if I turn over to Nicholas Gurren from Three, who's the next speaker. Thank you. Forgive me for the French accent. <laughs> As clear as possible. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, wig, uh, uh, you've got some brochure on your on your uh, chairs. Uh, wig is uh, very briefly is a, uh, a large French uh, construction company, but not just a construction company. It's a it's a conglomerate made with uh, a couple of uh, uh, big entities such as uh, Alstom, uh, TV Channel, uh, mobile companies, Colas, uh, World Builder, and uh, a big construction and uh, house building activity across uh, 82 countries uh, in the world. 
Uh, in the UK, we've been working in the UK for 15 years uh, through our construction activity with UK. Uh, and uh, we've implemented the, the property development arm, which is uh, named Quick Development, uh, three years ago, <coughs> to develop uh, mixed use, residential, but commercial as well, mixed use schemes in London and the south of the UK. And uh, we, we might move a bit further north in the next coming uh, months. So, in, in terms of uh, the PRS, the PRS is, is a very important thing for. for for us, uh, we believe that there is a well, there is a tremendous demand for housing in the UK, far far more than uh, anywhere else in, in, in the world, uh, in let's say Western countries. Uh, the problem is that people cannot afford to pay their flats for their flats. Uh, no mortgage are available. The deposits which are requested by the banks are now 25, 30 percent, whereas it was five percent. So that's that's a big issue. And um, I think the PRS uh, might bridge this gap and possibly giving the opportunity for people who are not eligible to the, the affordable sector, to affordable housing, and who cannot afford to pay for a London flat or, or, or a full flat uh, in, in London or, or anywhere else, to access to a distant home. <coughs> and uh, this is where the private transit sector can uh, bridge uh, uh, this gap. Because uh, anywhere uh, in the world, uh, I think when you have a first-time buyer which is uh, who is 37, 38 years old, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, sustainable. Uh, so <coughs> we've talked about build to let. I think build to let is, is a really different market from my point of view because uh, the buy to let, sorry, well, build, is very different to, to, to buy to let. Uh, buy to let has been built on individual on a speculative market and I think now we need to shift from uh, this angle and uh, we need to uh, for, for the buy to late as opposed to the to the to the to the build to late there was a very poor management and that's why a lot of borrowers are complaining about this uh, type of uh, tenure and I think the, the, the PRS will be uh, let's see very efficient to a very efficient tenure as long as we can offer to the sector a very well experienced uh, property management on all uh, uh, flats and it's for the purpose of big and small institution but not for individual definitely one thing which is very important <coughs> for Joe was IITM is I think uh, branding is key if we want to have the PRS which is sustainable, which works in this country, we need to brand it. We need to differentiate ourselves from the affordable sector and from uh, the for sale market. Uh, there is a big question about why a lot of big institutions are not investing in that sector. I think they are very shy to some extent, probably uh, used to having a fixed income, uh, getting a fixed, a fixed return without taking any, any risk. Of course, the PRS ask, requires uh, uh, more risk. Uh, we will not get necessarily a guarantee of payment from uh, the property manager or from the, the tenant. So this is something which needs to, to change. Uh, in the UK, uh, Surprisingly, the big institutions have not been present on, the, on this sector for one single reason. Uh, well, because the yields are not attractive enough and no guarantee. And those people, those who are interested in the sector, are smaller investors. And I think that uh, I think Roger, uh, uh, Roger is in the room, can confirm this. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, the medium size is uh, for one investor is one or two buildings, no more. So it's, it's really small institution. Uh, so why should, should, they, so should the big institution invest in this sector? I think uh, over the 15 years we can see that the rental sector, uh, there is in the rental, rental sector there is a continuing growth and a very steady return. Uh, the model is changing and commercial returns will be, I think, smaller over the next coming years. 
There is a challenging period of unemployment, unemployment in the UK against a huge and tremendous demand of housing, and the population will, will still increase, particularly in London. <coughs> and the developer contractors are, well, this is our business model, are, are offering an attractive model which could offset the developer's profit and, 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 and generate a bit uh, more attractive uh, return for uh, uh, the investor. Uh, finally, on, on, on this, I think the, the housing association, uh, which are struggling to find uh, a way through the, the, the new affordable rent model, might find a way forward with the private rented sector as well. And well, they are closer to the market than uh, uh, anywhere else, anybody else. So uh, finally, why we are interested in this in this sector? And uh, just to tell you that we are setting up a fund, a private rented fund. Uh, in the region of 150 million to start with, which will be up and running uh, end of this year. And we have an existing pipeline of project, which will uh, be uh, sold to this fund. Uh, it's a model where all the developers' profits we could be making uh, flow down to the investor as a better uh, return. We have a strong cash position, so it helps us to bridge the construction finance and the development finance if they need. And, uh, uh, least but not, well, it's, it's a very important point, I think. Uh, we, we've got some expertise and some experience in that sector across uh, uh, our, our, our developments uh, and the existing funds we have in Switzerland, in France, and uh, in uh, Germany. So. Uh, this is something we, we, we are targeting very much for, for the end uh, of, of, uh, of this year and we'll be seeking for bringing on board uh, investors uh, in spring 2011, so uh, very, very short. And uh, I, I would, I would, I would, um, <coughs> I would say, finish in saying that uh, we need to change in, in the UK the mindset, so it's, it will be difficult because we, we uh, as opposed to a lot of countries uh, here, we have uh, mindset that ownership is to make money to, to get not just ownership but to be a bit speculative. I think as David Lance was saying uh, recently, we need to shift from uh, this mindset and housing should be a good rather than an asset. I think it's a, it's a very important thing that uh, we change our mind if we want this uh, private rented sector to be a great success. Thank you. Okay, so I think from there we have we who are obviously moving into this area, arguing that it is, they presume it's going to become more uh, attractive to uh, larger investors. Uh, they argue that the private sector needs to change and have better property management, uh, and they agree that branding is important. I think uh, the person who responds to that is actually probably best, Alan. Alan from the Residential Landlords Association, um, whose sector has just come under attack, and I'm sure will now do a very good job in defending it. Good afternoon. Um, the Residential Landlords Association, for those who don't know us, is one of two national bodies representing landlords, investors in the private rented sector. And we have about 10,000 subscribers, that's around 15,000 landlords. They control uh, something like 150,000 properties in the UK, so it's about 5% of the market in our membership. We provide advice, we provide uh, education, which is very important, and training and an accreditation scheme, we provide information, we also do research. So here I stand before you, I am a landlord too, as well as being chairman of this, uh, this body, and I think I'm the epitome of David Cameron's big society. You see, I use my money, I supply a range of affordable property, and I manage it for no pay. And that's because it's treated as unearned income. So I don't think the government can get a better deal than that because it gets people housed for no public cost. Now as we've heard, and quite rightly, the PRS has grown. It began, as Matt said, at the beginning of the Housing Act 88. But then the big thing was when Gordon Brown took away the pension credits in 97. That was worth five billion a year. And Arla and Paragon um, entered the market with a consumer-style mortgage product nicely called buy to let. 
so investors took charge of their own financial destiny. And if yesterday's Telegraph's headlines uh, right, then baby boomers like me and some of you uh, will need it all to pay for our old age care. But this bubble grew, didn't it? We, we know that well. And then speculators started to milk it. And I think the crossover point was about 2006, when the number of buy-to-let mortgages exceeded those of first-time buyers. And really, was that any surprise? Because every television company we screened and looked at was producing get-rich-quick property programs. And you notice, in those programs, nobody ever paid any capital gains tax. Fantastic publicity, so you know, it's no surprise that the, the, um, the bubble grew. But the million or so buy to let mortgages that exist now account for only about a third of the private tenancies. Yet the market is defined by this buy to let phenomenon. So is history going to repeat itself? Or in other words, do we need rampant house price inflation? to attract investment to the private rented sector to solve the impending housing crisis? Well, I pray God no. And the question that we're asked today is, should we increase the numbers of private renters? How might it be done and what impact would it have? Well, look, there's no question that we need growth. But from a landlord's point of view, I'd like to share some of the factors which are preventing that growth, and they're twofold. One is legislative, and the other is fiscal. So the housing stock is relatively finite, we've got 26 million or so houses, and we need a quarter of a million more every year um, to feed this, this growth in households. So by the election, we could have a shortfall of half a million, wouldn't that be good news? Um, currently there's about four and a half tenants vying for every tenant that comes on the market, but shortages distort markets, and I don't think that rampant rent inflation is, is good for either tenants nor for landlords in the long term. So, from a legislative point of view, there's over 60 laws and regulations controlling landlords like me. And there's 1.2 million of us. The CLG said back in October that they wouldn't increase legislation. But what did they issue the other day? Consultation on security standards for rented property. I really don't know. Um, now, Professor Michael Ball had it right in, he wrote a report for Joseph Ramfrey Foundation, I'm sure some of you know it, um, on the PRS as a source of affordable accommodation. And he said that regulation and the threat of regulation puts off investors. He also said that roads ignore rules. Now clearly the last government didn't appreciate that when they introduced the Housing Act. <coughs> they, because they then set targets for councils to license HMOs. Houses and multiple occupation. Um, but what did councils do? <coughs> because they were set targets, they went after the low hanging fruit, they went after the compliant landlords, they let off the roads, and they've done that measure's done absolutely nothing for the worst off tenants, and I don't think it's too very much either uh, in terms of improvement in property standards. Now, the paradox may arise where regulations deter good quality investors. And the shortages will generate substantial incentives for those who flout the rules. So the outcome is the opposite of what was intended, that the quality offer would actually fall. Now this conference proposition is also that private renters have lower satisfaction levels than the home owners, like we've said, um, that PRS tenants are better satisfied than social renters, but unless regulation is targeted at those who flout the rules, then this might not be the case for very long. My organisation says that the majority of landlords are well-meaning. We support accreditation. Um, and that's of property standards, but also of the management of the properties. <coughs> it's only as good as the... You know, if you left the property on its own, didn't put people in it, it would last a lot longer. Um, but we believe that self-regulation will allow enforcement to be targeted on those who willfully ignore the rules and flout them. Now, private landlords tend to buy all the property, and this is a bit like the second-hand car market. For every new car buy, you need somebody to buy the banger. But unlike cars, property is almost infinitely refurbishable, and here's another current anomaly, and those are the planning regulations. You see, 
by far the biggest sector of the PRS are those tenants aged 80 to 35. It just happens to coincide with those wanting to acquire their own properties, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, many of those tenants have shared houses, first of all as students and then burdened by debt. <coughs> they want to share a house again because it is affordable accommodation. But last October, there was the new planning use class that will discriminate against just these tenants. And it will also affect the value of the homeowners. And in 2013, local housing allowance for 135 will be limited to the single room rent. So you've got all this pressure on the most valuable part of the market, so it's going to heighten the prices for these young people, making scarce just the sort of housing that the PRS provides best, which I believe is affordable, short-term tenancies for people who need to move to follow their careers. So can we build the that? Well, the corporate landlord, well, that model only really works in the UK when there's enormous subsidy. The corporate investment is dividend-driven, and the PRS makes a return of 65%. <coughs> and out of that would have to come all the expensive overheads. So can we create branded homes? Well, there are substantial investors in the market for students, for key workers and retirees. But it's likely that the middle market of new-built properties would be aspirational properties with rents to match. So I say that the lean and efficient PRS is very good at recycling older property. And we could do better. Um, there should be better tax allowances for property improvement including major refurbishments. You see, normally such work only qualifies for capital gains tax relief when it's sold. And a lot of landlords are sitting on these properties because of their capital gains tax liabilities. And they're just the sort of properties that first-time buyers could afford. So that's locked in as well. So there is concern about the condition of the stock in the private rental sector, and that could be helped by better tax allowances, because when a property changes hands, the new owner invariably refurbishes the property. And in this case, rollover tax relief would further stimulate the market and help generate more PRS stock, and of course it would benefit the Treasury too, in terms of tax issues. The affordability of housing for first-time buyers is not, a, it's not in question, but it's the supply of mortgages and the liquidity position of the banks and the lenders, which is. Now, that may improve next year, or the end of next year, I believe. But finally, if we're going to build, I suggest that we get rid of section 106. And that is nothing but a tax on the private sector to fund social housing. We also need to get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy in building because that's amounting, I'm told, up to about 25% of the cost of new property. So the PRS is dynamic, it's adaptable, it's a provider of housing, and as proof of that, we added about a million units in the last decade. But with the current economic constraints, social housing is limited in, what, in how it can respond, and it will be a few years before the first time buyer um, returns to affordability. So I say to you that the private landlords of Britain have the remedy, and we are already part of the big society. Uh, an interesting perspective there, basically saying that uh, the existing landlords, uh, rather than institutional ones, are have lower yields than they would large institutions, uh, large institutions would require. So in effect, they're they're doing a, a service to society by uh, charging rent that would be lower than otherwise the case. And the best thing that the government can do in this area is to remove some of the regulation, particularly section 106, and perhaps create tax allowances uh, where you want to try and sell off. And uh, having heard from the, the existing buy to let landlords, as it were, is that all that sector, uh, now we go to first time buyers, and uh, Matt Griffin to price down and see what you think. <coughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm from Price Out. We're a group uh, representing First Time Buyers. We're made up of volunteers with a lot of kind of economic experience um, who came about partly because we were rather concerned about the state 
passing policy as you would be, um, not just in terms of media coverage, but also in terms of the policy making process. And I was, I had the misfortune to be uh, a bystander watching and advising CLG in the latter part of the late years. Um, and it's hard not to come to the conclusion that the policy making process in CLG um, failed the consumer, didn't really ask very tough questions about the consumer. Um, it listened far too much to producer groups and it was also quite parochial. Um, it didn't really ask questions about what was happening in broader financial markets or broader macroeconomic questions. And it didn't really link up that well with the Treasury. Um, uh, so they didn't tend to read the FT, and if they did, it was quite a narrow part of the FT. Um, what, you know, I have, we have nothing against landlords. Um, uh, we think a lot of landlords are doing a good job. Um, and in many ways, landlords are making choices within a framework that is the UK housing investment market, which um, doesn't really encourage rational choices, um, but it, you can kind of understand where they're coming from. I think the question for us is really about policymakers and the structure of the PLS. Um, and I think policymakers have got it wrong and they are continuing to get it wrong. Um, and it's un I can't, you can understand slightly why this is happening, partly because policymakers have seen the three components of the UK housing market and two of those pillars uh, both incredibly inflexible, I own an occupation or social rented, and they're also politically very difficult to deal with. If you start attacking tenants, tenancy rights in the uh, social rented sector, you get huge political backlash. And if you start to talk about the total for occupation, then the daily amount of the will come after you. So policymakers understandably think, how do we get flexibility in the housing market, which we need? And they identify the private rental sector as the one way of injecting that flexibility. But I think they've been quite narrow, they kind of suffer from the same mistakes that CLG <coughs> has acro across the board on housing policy, i.e. don't really think about consumer, listen too much to producer interests, and don't think about the bigger questions that should concern us given the record of UK housing and the record of the boom. Um, so I think there are four questions I think we need to address the private rental sector, both in looking at its past performance and in thinking about what should it look like in the future. The first is, was it a good use of investment finance? <coughs> You know, there's a lot of money sloshing around from 2000 to 2007. Um, was it well used? Um, second is, does it deliver for the supply side? Um, does it create those new units which the UK desperately needs? Um, the third is, how does it interact with and what are the implications for the owner occupation and residential market? Okay, how do they sit and how do they exacerbate problems or uh, help uh, alleviate problems? Um, and the fourth, I think, is, what does it mean for wider uh, financial and economic stability? And I think of all four of those questions, the, pre, the kind of current and past performance for the private rental sector has been pretty poor. Um, so I'll just go through the main reasons why I think that is, um, and kind of a review of PRS and, and it's mainly the buy to let experience <coughs> of the past decade or so. Um, firstly, I think if you want to understand what happened from 2000 to 2007, if you want to understand the boom or the bubble or whatever you want to call it, you have to look at what was going on in the private rental sector, in particular what was happening in to let That was where the major growth in mortgage finance was. If you look at the percentages, and you know, buy to let started around 3%, 2 back in 1997. By 2000, it was 10% of the UK residential mortgage lending. By 2007, it was 26%. Um, in contrast, early occupation, um, uh, straight kind of uh, residential mortgages declined as a percentage. So they went from over half down to 35%. Um, the rest was um, mortgage equity reliefs, which doesn't really count for demand. So if you're looking at where did the key source of effective demand come from, it was quite a It wasn't residential. Um, the other question, uh, uh, and the kind of the peak of at the peak of the, of, of the market, that growth was quite staggering. I mean, between the first half of 2006 and the second half of 2006, growth in buy-to-let mortgage rose by 20%. Now, that's an amazing growth in identifiable investor demand um, for the UK housing market. Um, and we need to think about what that did for prices and things. Um, the second question about what, what it meant for demand was around the form of demand. And I think if you look at what was happening in terms of the mortgage financing, um, the PRS sector was a leading uptaker of um, pretty volatile forms and sources of mortgage finance. 
Um, so it was at the forefront of the specialist mortgage uh, market. Um, it was at the forefront of mortgage brokers. That was really what drove forward the sector. And also of the non-banking sector, so uh, GMAP and others. Um, by 2007, 20% of BTL mortgage finance came from the non-banking sector. Um, and obviously that was exacerbated by the reliance on just only and by the use of gearing and the use of debt-based leverage. I mean, if you walked into a buy investment club in 2006, and um, they were talking about anything other than property, they were talking about stocks, you would have thought that you would kind of suddenly wandered into an investment suicide club. I mean, what they're doing was um, a, a very high risk. Um, and also, I think, that if you're looking again at demand, it's about a question about the quality of demand that came from that sector. Um, and the investment rationale behind the PRS, behind that flow of money, was very different from owner occupation, okay? Owner occupation has dual use um, rationale. So it's, you live in it and you hope to make some money out of it. Um, by to let financial work, the financial gain was the sole rationale. And what was interesting is that it wasn't like on the continental model where you had uh, a rational look at yield over a long period of time. From quite early on, from about 2003-2004, capital gains were the case, primary driver um, for investment in the sector. Um, and both CLG and Treasury studies find that. They find that you have um, negative yields almost. Um, so if you're, looking for, if you're looking at an investment which has a negative income flow and is predicated on the basis of capital gain, now that seems to me a fairly good definition of speculation. Um, and that was the major part of the market for quite a few number of years. Um, so, what does that mean? I think it means buy to let, we need to look at it a bit more skeptically in terms of the financing basis. And that it was a very important mechanism for transmitting, firstly, a more effective demand to the market. Um, secondly, more risky types of financing models. Um, and, and thirdly, uh, transmitting that speculative component. Um, and it obviously benefited, unfortunately, from complete lack of regulatory oversight because by to let wasn't uh, overseen by FSA um, for what, what use that would be, but, uh, and it still isn't overseen by FSA. Um, so obviously we know where that got us. Um, but I think what questions has that raised about its interaction with the owner occupation market and the, the wider economy? Um, unfortunately, it's not detached and they're quite closely related. Um, and it has implications for, obviously, first half buyers but also has implications for institutional investors as well, um, in that a couple of things that flow of demand did. Firstly, it had a major impact on pricing. Um, now, in a situation which is the UK housing market, where a supply is not particularly responsive, any large increase in demand is primarily going to be reflected through price rather than supply response. And that's what happened. And there are lots of different measurements about how big that uh, additional boost was and how much of it was uh, speculative. I mean, David Miles um, estimated it was about 40% about of the house price growth uh, uh, in the Northeast was based upon expectations rather than true sort of supply demand uh, balances. Um, but I think from a first time buyer perspective, what's interesting is quite as the specific uh, implications it had for the, for the pricing mechanism in markets, <coughs> particularly first time buyer markets, which are the lower level properties. Okay. What uh, buy to let and uh, that investment finance did was shifted the pricing mechanism in a lot of housing markets. It shifted it away from essentially someone going to the local building society and judging uh, and, and fixing the price of the property based upon their income to uh, uh, the price ratio. And it flipped that and it shifted it away in lots of uh, quite local markets into one where it was pricing based upon. Um, rental yield minus, minus financing costs. And in a situation where you have very high rental demand um, and uh, very low financing costs, that pushes the price up quite substantially. And I think it's no coincidence if you look at the a graph of uh, historical price to income ratios um, for nationwide produce, there's a sharp detachment from the traditional, uh, <coughs> uh, the traditional ratios from about 2003. And I think you can put that down to the PRS sector. Um, and it, it, it's also interesting, I think, in the interaction it has with first time buyers, um, in that they often compete for the same market. Um, and buy to let are able to outbid first time buyers for a variety of reasons. The first is the obvious one is that buy to let tend to be older, so they have more equity. Um, the 
second, I think, are more structural. Um, first is the, the type of finance they use. Um, by to that, I mean, CML don't give official figures, but it's quite a high proportion. Um, overwhelmingly use interest over mortgages. Um, so, and in 2009, 90% of first-time buyers went to the payment. So that's immediately uh, a difference in purchasing power between the two groups. The second is around the tax issue, where, in a way, you have this, uh, the tax regime for property, but entrance costs has a problem, because uh, by to that, because their business, are able to write off their mortgage costs um, against tax. Um, so they effectively are writing off the major part of their financing costs against, by, uh, against uh, uh, in their business model. So they clearly have a major purchasing power advantage against first-time buyers, and you can see that in the graph. It's fairly clear that by to that has been displacing first-time buyers. Um, now, for a policy area and a, a kind of political arena where the whole debate about housing is so predicated upon owner occupation, and we saw yesterday with Grant Shapps' summit, is so predicated upon the value of first-time buyers, I think that's something policymakers need to grapple with a bit more effectively. Um, the other impact of vital that, and this is the final point, um, is around supply. Okay? Given the fact you had so much money moving into the sector, did it produce the new homes that we need? Um, which is a critical question. I mean, was the investment capital being effectively used? And unfortunately, despite this huge flow of investment capital, you were, the main story is essentially the PRS cannibalizing existing supply. Um, from, in every year from 2003 to 2008, you saw a net loss. If you took the amount of new, new market build minus the amount of uh, new buy to let mortgages, and it's thought to say that that's an underestimation of the total PRS, because only about 50% of buy to let land was used by to let mortgages. If you look at that, every year there's a net loss, and it was a cumulative loss of 650,000 homes. Um, in a period where the government put particular emphasis on building new homes. Um, and that's a real problem. That's a real waste of investment resources. Um, and if you look at the general supply side response in terms of what the private market did, uh, but, and, and, and what additional uh, grow, uh, uh, build can be attributed to, uh, to the PRS, the actual supply side response was quite weak. Um, it, wasn't, it didn't grow that fast, considering the amount of money available. And what it tended to do, I think, was it, divert, it changed the nature of housing development. So you saw a major diversion away from um, houses with gardens, which people tend to want, into flats, which people don't tend to want, and uh, <coughs> or don't tend to want rich <coughs> culture and the that kind of And that rose from quite, flats rose from quite low levels to 40% in 0405. And I think if you look at, we talk to developers, if you look at local level studies, the key thing for them was <laughs> the price of that offered quite attractive upfront financing, and you could, um, uh, flats were a good way to meet that demand. Um, so yeah, that's my input. So in, in summary, it's the, uh, we have uh, the contrary view that the private rental sector is not necessarily um, a fantastic thing, and that one of, particularly the, the buy to let model, um, <coughs> basically cannibalised first time buyers, it, it pushed up prices because they could get uh, access to mortgages, partly due to tax advantages, and this meant that people were frozen out, and unfortunately, because we have a rather dysfunctional planning system, it didn't even have a positive effect of building more homes. It just meant the existing stock shifted from uh, own occupation uh, into the private rented sector. Um, I think we've got two roving mics, uh, which I think we may bring into play. We've got half an hour left. I think um, <coughs> one thing which is quite interesting is to me is where exactly we're going now. Given all this has happened, uh, just before we get to, the, to questions from the floor, a uh, quick summation of where do people think the market is going to go now? Are houses going to go down? Is, are, is this private rental sector going to continue to expand? Um, just sort of uh, literally 30 seconds on if government does nothing, changes nothing, what will happen? I think we start there and sort of work our way around. I think that's quite an interesting point to kick off debate. Uh, shortage of supply is, is not going to change, and therefore the pressure for uh, ongoing inflation is going to, to uh, develop. Um, I think what is going to be important and what does seem to be shown in a way differently than before is the quality of product. If the inflation is not going to sit there as it does in the most of the market, I completely agree with Matt's position, then in fact I think there becomes a quality of product which is the offer, which is actually the only stability that you can find in the investment market. 
you think that it ma that will happen by itself, as in that you will have this branded product with greater security? Because some people argue that you change the legislative structure, so you have greater security of tech. <coughs> so they argue that, that, that you need less of change for before so I mean, branding and other things can come in. I would say that if we look at the legislative structure for planning regulation, i.e. the supply side, I think that the requirement for 2016 in terms of the sustainability requirement of low energy is putting a lot of pressure on the kind of quality of product. Also, I think the mayor, certainly in central London, the mayor's demand for larger size accommodation is actually changing that aspiration. And I think, interestingly, statistically, something I've seen for the first time ever, which is there is an increase in a rate per square foot relative to the size of accommodation. Additionally, that used to say that you used to say there was a glass ceiling, and therefore you were ending up by, by the market was driven to produce smaller and smaller units to get the better rates. But I think some of the high priced uh, accommodation now is the inverse of that. And the accommodation, if it's a, a larger scale, is actually dominating a, a, a bigger price because the other one is responsible for that. Where do you think you would go if the government did nothing? Um, I, I would say there, there aren't a lot of solutions. Uh, uh, the PRS uh, is one thing, but if you look at the affordable, uh, I don't think the affordable will uh, cop uh, over the next following, uh, uh, five years, uh, lack of funding. Uh, so we have to deal with this new affordable rent. I don't think that this will enable uh, the housing association to to replace or to, to, to do what they were used to doing uh, uh, two or three years ago. Uh, in terms of the house building, in terms of uh, uh, new builds uh, for ownership, I think it's still very, very tricky. Uh, mortgages, deposit, people cannot pay. And when, when you think that uh, mostly 50% of uh, the deposit are paid by the parents, uh, I don't think it's a sustainable uh, uh, thing. So. Uh, we can't count on the government, we can't count, we just need to count on ourselves. And I think, again, the private transit sector needs to be uh, promoted by, by, by everybody. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of things, mindsets, growth. If, if more and more people are talking about this new market, I think people will change their mind as well as the institution. Uh, Matt, where do you think we're going in the next few years? Um, mm -hmm. well, that's a good question. Um, uh, if the government did nothing, I think, I don't think I'd fall on balance, I think, I think that's how fast it goes. Um, both our landlords and others would be hit, because I think uh, not particularly rational investment decisions. Um, I think, and I hope, what this experience mm -hmm. might be like is a kind of classic gold rush experience. Like in a tech bubble, you had a period of massive over-exuberance where lots of small people did very stupid things. But afterwards, the government sat down and thought, what is the institutional structure we want to have a decent sector that um, doesn't have these massive economic externalities but produces a good um, And I hope something evolves along so it becomes more institutionalized. Uh, but for that to happen, prices need to go down, otherwise institutional investors aren't going to have the yields to invest. So, um, and finally, Alan. Well, as I say, past performance is no guarantee of future results. And I don't think you can, you can guesstimate the future by what's happened in the last 10 years. It's been extraordinary. There are, there are two issues here, and one is significant the supply of, of new housing. And unless that begins to happen, uh, the, the pressures will remain on rents um, and the price of the marketplace. I mean, there isn't sufficient supply of houses for a state agent alone at the moment. That, that's a tending to hold price for that. Um, but I think, I think the actual house. Um, House prices will tend to remain about the same, depends where you are in the country. The bigger demand in London, out in the regions, it's, um, it's less stable. Um, but I don't think it's a good thing that there is this upward pressure on rents. And we have the um, local housing allowance factor, um, where the pressure is being put on landlords to reduce their rents. Although, from our research, uh, landlords say, well, they'll walk out of the market. We're actually going to be in a very fluid situation I think, in the next uh, two years. And until any sort of feel good factor comes back into the country, probably sort of post the Olympics, and that you're starting to get into the approach to the next election, um, I don't think there'll be much.
much of a, a taste for investment. Uh, we're going to see each other the price, uh, and, and I think I'm not sure of the price will we, we go up uh, uh, over the next few years. But if you look at the an investment, big institution across uh, Western countries, which are investing in private rented sectors, so being a average return, which is far below 5%, far below. We are talking between four to four point five percent. So this is a sector which is which is uh, workable at far far below five percent. It's it's about mindset again. Okay. I think one of the most interesting things I think is the fact that quarter of all mortgages are currently being supported by the Bank of England uh, and two schemes, which I think often isn't quite discussed. But I completely agree on the supply side that we need to liberalise, but I think the demand side is also quite interesting. Yeah. Um, who has a question? Sorry, if you could, um, sorry, so we can get a mic to you and you can just say uh, your name and where you're from. And if you have a particular uh, speaker that you want to direct it to, please feel free to indicate. Lu Lucy I for me, um, Councillor Hammersmith and Forum. Um, I think some of the speakers have forgotten them and some of them are too <coughs> young to understand where the private rented sector came from. You know, when, when I was sort of a student or batting around trying to find places to live, there wasn't a private rented sector. You know, if you want somewhere to sleep, try a park bench. Uh, there, you could not find anywhere to rent for large more money. And that, of course, was a consequence of uh, the uh, security of tenure and the rent controls uh, put in place earlier by well-meaning but short-sighted governments. So we've come from a stage where there was no private rented sector to a stage where I suspect private rented sector is beginning to get in balance with what is the underlying a demand of the population for rental accommodation. Uh, and um, of course we've, we've had the bubble of uh, you know, over the last five years when, when people went a little bit out of kilter. So that's really what, what has been going on. And I don't think we should expect or indeed blame private rented sector for taking up a larger than usual share of purchase of properties because it's come from zero to where it is now. Uh, it, what matters is what happens going forward. And I suspect you'll, you'll find you know, a steady balance uh, with the market sorting things out. Uh, Alan or uh, Matt, I presume, who, who, either, both of you want to have a quick... Uh, so, uh, the one is to say that, that, that uh, neither of us will remember it, but uh, a century ago, the rental market was much bigger. Mm -hmm. And, and that, it is subject to uh, legislation. And what we're seeing is a response, particularly, as I said at the beginning, to the uh, 88 Act and, and the right to repossess. Is that yeah, right? I think institution stronger as well in the 20s and 30s. Um, uh, big insurance companies, very major hold. And in fact, it was the rent controls that took them out of the market. So to bring them yeah. back into the market, yes. they have to feel comfortable with them and they feel that so good. Yeah. So basically, since 1988, it's only just got around to institutional investment. You're right, it just companies have taken 20 years to realise that, hang on, there's no, there's no way my rent that has now been repealed and it's not going to come back. Matt, what would you say? Yeah, I, don't, I really don't have a problem with the private rental sector. I just wish it didn't blow up the economy. Uh, well, it was at it. Um, and I also think I wish we had a bit more of an honest debate. Because it hasn't been fought through in terms of financial regulation and because the overall occupation sector hasn't really been addressed, both in terms of new supply and in also in terms of tax incentives for holding, etc., etc., all the pressure on the growth of the private rental sector has been on uh, first time buyers and young uh, occupiers who have been, been squeezed out. Have had to take on additional risk in order to go to the market. Um, so you see no stock response, or very little. Um, and it hasn't really, it's, it's it distributionally, it's actually benefited a large chunk of existing owner and occupiers and put a strain on a quite small bundle of them. So I wish it had been done better. So would you be happy if, if I mean, if there was a general increase in supply, the private rental sector continues to be at its present size, but there are just more homes being built and therefore housing more affordable? Um, do, uh, do you want to? Oh, sorry, I'll go with um, the gentleman with the pen. Um, I've just got a couple of quick points to make and then um, a question to follow up. Um, one I think is that um, 
there's a, a danger, I'm not saying any of this because I'm uh, showing this, but in some of these debates to look at the private rental sector and home ownership as a choice going forward um, about where the area of growth is going to be. And given that home ownership peaked in about 2003 and has been declining since, and the BRS has been rising, I mean, it's very much now a fact and growing fact of the housing market. And I think at the very least, that shows that the government should have a public rental sector strategy of some sort we coordinated interventions in the private rental sector rather than a series of undoing up acts and so on and regulations, so at least it's coordinated. Um, the <coughs> second point is on um, in, in, individual uh, investors versus institutional investors. And I mean, I think again there's a danger in this that um, there can be a slight over-focus on institutions where even in European countries that have a large amount of institutional investment, such as somewhere like Germany, um, individuals, I believe, still make up over 50% of the landlords in Germany. So while institutions can be very good at delivering supply, nonetheless, we still have to work on the you know, managing individuals who are landlords and improving the quality of their management performance and so on. Um, and on the, the, the sort of final point is on this interaction between supply and regulation. The, the point made that um, there, is that, there is that relationship and obviously the private rental sector did used to be historically much higher in that it was, I think, at the turn of the First World War, about 90% of... 90% uh, years ago, 90% of which was owned by institutions. Indeed. Um, and, you know, there's been that relationship between regulation and supply since. Um, the, the difficulty I have with that debate at the moment as it stands is that the private rental sector has grown continuously for 23 years and it's grown during the period of additional regulation and there is now a dangerous imbalance between the provider and the purchaser on this. You do have a lot of areas between you know, four and six tenants going for each individual let, which gives the, the provider of that let quite a lot of power relative to the tenant. Um, and Unfortunately, that means that there is a worry that the market itself won't drive up standards because of that, because there isn't a market incentive to drive up standards from the landlord. Uh, from the landlord. So my concern is that far from there being too much regulation, there might be uncoordinated regulation, there may be a need for a more coordinated strategy. I really have the feeling that there isn't sufficient regulation from it. And I mean, from shelter services, we see that the private rental sector um, boxes well above its weight in terms of the number of uh, complaints and issues that come in through our advice centres. And, you know, it is a sector where there are a lot of criminal rogues operating in it, but it's also a sector where 50% of the stock is non-decent. So it is also a widespread issue of you know, poor levels of housing. So I think I think the, the, the point about the regulation would be overplayed in the current world. Do you, uh, do you uh, think there is an argument to be made, if I, <coughs> I've heard it made, that if you had uh, longer tenancy, but this, the people would be less inclined to sign up to bad landlords and bad properties if they knew that they were going to be in there for a longer period. And that's the, the reason that we have is a sort of perpetual cycle. The landlords have a short term tenant, they might have six months, so they don't do the property up that well because they might trash it and it's not worth it. So I, there's, I, there's a, I, I, I think this, I think I, this, this, is an, this is an argument someone's put forward to me in a meeting that there is a, a link between the fact that the, the problems of the private sector are mostly due to the fact that we have in the UK versus other countries the level of satisfaction is down to the fact that we had shorter tenants. I don't know if this is... Um, I, mean, I, I mean, on that, on that point just specifically, I mean, on that, the, the chart of wonder produced of countries as they get richer within Europe, they tend to have more of the private they, they also tend to have more security than the private rental sector as well. And I don't think it's necessarily, the impact of that security isn't on the original purchaser decision, it's on the balance of power between landlords and tenants. I mean, it's very hard to pursue a complaint against a private landlord at the moment if they can pursue possession against you within two months for no reason. Um, you know, even if you've been paying oh, some time at all. So, I mean, I mean, uh, and that's a contention with some of the changes to tenure in the social sector as well, which is that you know, if your tenure, if your tenancy is up for review within six months, you don't have much of an incentive to try and drive up management performance of that value. So, Alan, I have to let Alan respond before I take any other questions. I wouldn't come to shelter if I didn't have a problem with my tenancy. So I can, understand the bias of, I can understand the bias of your opinion. But 82% satisfaction from tenants in the private rental sector is not a bad score. 
Um, I'm not justifying the 18% that are dissatisfied, but I'm saying, on average, it's not bad. Um, there's a, um, sorry, the, the business about uh, two months, because we've only got two months to get out. Um, the courts don't even fulfill that. Accelerated possession is taking something like four to six months, and in that time, there's a lot of tenants out there who will not be paying their rent. And if you're applying for normal uh, possession, that can be up to eight to 10 months before you actually get your property back. And that's eight or 10 months without rent. So there's a lot of bad tenants out there. What I would say is that if the tenants were better educated to, uh, to identify a good landlord and a good property, then we'd make some progress. In the market where there's potentially four of them per property, that might be very difficult. Not everywhere. Uh, Not everywhere. Um, I, I'm going to take the, the lady at the back, uh, the ginger scarf. I suppose the other lady at the back. Uh, uh, Rachel Blake from East London Housing Partnership, East London home to quite a large thriving private rented sector. I just wanted to emphasise how important I think it is to separate out some of the issues that uh, the priced out person is talking about, the current private rented sector and, and what it's done to the economy and how that may or may not be a problem and what the British person was talking about in terms of increasing institutional investment. RICs and, and how those are, we should be able to have honest conversations about those two without confusing the fact that actually it's more institutional investment in a, in a decent private rental sector would be a very good thing and it would be a very different product. So I think it's important to make that distinction. Uh, RICs organised an event last week which I'm afraid they had a much more optimistic perspective on the private rental sector in terms of institutional investment. Um, the person from we said that there wasn't a good yield uh, from, from the product, whereas the people last week thought there was um, on the basis, and I think they were talking about more capital investment and they were talking less about the risk of tenants not paying their rents. So I just wondered whether you could explain to me how in a week uh, it's been a great idea to it being a rather a riskier idea. <laughs> Sorry, because I don't think you were there, but um, <laughs> I promise that that's, how, that's what they said. Um, great question. I think um, for, 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 us, for us, attracting big, big institutions uh, would be um, providing we have a good product. Uh, uh, without any good product, and it meets, it meets what we were saying about short-term tenancy. I don't think it's a problem short uh, tenancy or secure tenancy. Uh, in the US, for instance, uh, you've got 18 months turnover amongst uh, uh, those uh, tenants. Uh, so, and it works very well. It's because people, the tenants are used to uh, going to uh, very well managed, they know the product, there are services, etc. And this is really what we need to offer to offer to the market and to the big institution to give them confidence to invest in that market that there is a way forward. In terms of uh, what we've seen so far, uh, we've met a lot of big institution investors. There is an appetite, but we have not sought out this uh, this uh, risk issue about uh, lack lack of income and lack of certainty in terms of income. So this is something we need to 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 to, to work on. And, uh, uh, can I add? I mean, I, I think the most interesting. Uh, pointer to the large scale institutional investment is in fact what's happened at Olympic Village. So the, bid, the, 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 the bids that are out now for Olympic Village, which are 3,000 homes, are constructed to the quality that we've talked about. Um, actually, are now uh, bringing <coughs> a very competitive bid from institutions. I think they're 15 shortlisted parties, and then that's going through that kind of process. And I think the interesting thing here that we're not kind of identifying, I think it would help, is if we separated <coughs> or identified the difference between ownership and management. And I think that the, 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 the restraint that you see on the institutionals and institutional investment is that their comparative product, i.e. commercial property, is a management-free product. Because uh, in a commercial uh, tenancy at least, it's fully repaired and insuring, you have a managing agent that just collects the rents. And I used to laugh that the only conversation we ever had between you and an institutional investor and a tenant is once every five years when you come to review the rent. Uh, a 
and I think the the uh, role of the housing associations as managers or the role of professional managers into the institution as well as the role of the improvement of the product is, is not yet clear. But I think there needs to be that interface before the institutions are going to come in and actually feel comfortable. And in a way, that's where the kind of, the, you know, the private landlords are really demonstrating they do their own management, as you said. They are kind of, they don't, they don't charge a management fee. Whereas if, you, if an institution goes to uh, take a, 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 a PRS investment, they are going to need to employ an agent who is actually then going to take a management fee. So that's reducing that. And I think, in, in, just if I take this uh, example of, uh, in France, we have a lot, a lot of, um, um, quite direct to some extent, or individual who have invested in, in this market. And it works, it works very well uh, for tax incentive reasons. You may know that uh, the French government has, uh, has put a lot of uh, uh, tax incentives uh, on this model. But in addition to that, uh, they, are owner, they are the owner of the flats, but they are not the manager of the flats. So it, on each time, on each building, there is usually a property manager which is making things uh, properly uh, managed. And I think it's a very important point. And this is the reason why the buy to let market in the UK is uh, poorly considered by, by, by many local authorities. Um, we'll move on, uh, if I take the uh, gentleman with the purple tie, um, yeah. uh, like the act from OCIs, um, we'll be looking at market like the products for well, two and a half years now. And we've been down to America and seeing how they do it over there. Uh, visiting Archstone developments in Boston and so on. And um, the thing that struck us is, and I was pleased to hear it come up in several of the speakers' uh, pieces, that it's about the consumer. This is about identifying who is going to live in these properties, working out their lifestyle, their choices, their turnover, and then designing a product which actually, I have to say, is quite different to anything that we currently do in the mass housing market. So I have a question at the end of this, but the observation is, that we badging uh, homes that we couldn't sell or buying homes in the second-hand market isn't really for us what it's about. It's how we create a mass market which is well-managed, institutionally owned uh, and desirable for the consumer. So the question I have for the panel is, what can the government do to promote that market? 30 seconds from the <laughs> <or? laughs> Uh, I, I mean, my view, very simply, I, I completely endorse that. Obviously, I think that we need to have a product. It's a, it's a very complicated area of, of uh, consumer uh, understanding because a house is subject to its or house house or housing is subject to external verification on a planning context. I.e., if I want to build a house in this street or, or a block of apartments in this street or I want to build it in the street next door, they have <coughs> an envelope of what that looks at in the, in the city is by reference not to the occupation but by reference to a set of hierarchies and impacts of conservation area, etc, etc. So that the, the, uh, the rigor that I need, you need to adopt towards the product cannot be in a way demonstrated by its body. Hence, I've come to the conclusion that the market is differentiated between body and chassis. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, uh, the essence is that most of us in this room are all human beings. We all have a high level of roughly 1.7. There's an amazing similarity to the way we actually, most nights we lie flat on a, on a bed. Uh, we go to our kitchen, our fridge, and we eat and our children uh, still watch television and we try and make them do their homework. All of these things are quite standard. So bizarrely, you would say that as a designer, as a kind of product designer, to try and build a product around that lifestyle means that there is a kind of wide market out there if you can get it right. But what you then have to do is to find the interface of that similarity of product into what is the variable product when it actually hits up down the city. So what would the government, can the government, or is this, or do you, because I don't need to I think the government, the, the government needs to look at the ability to license a product. So 
So rather at the moment, I think that they they, they haven't actually. So there's like no mechanism yet. Yeah, effectively, if there was a mechanism that they could offer licenses, where you say where that well, this comes into the brand, where they are able to say here is a product that we actually like that actually satisfies a lot of that criteria, and therefore that product itself actually have, can have. Uh, uh, it is, it, it's deemed to have planning consent, apart from its relationship to the exter external envelope, then I think you would start to open up some of these um, constraints and, and open up the supply. Well, and enough. make it possible to actually construct volume, which is what the, the, as a manufacturing point of view, unless you have that volume, you can't actually get the kind of cost of the product together. Interesting, of course, the government's, uh, the, the very nimby, nimby localist, uh, the sort of the system the government's moving towards with things like referendums. If you have a brand new product and you take it and you want to build and you have local referendums and local say, then and you remove most of the other planning constraints, that actually would make it easier to get the kind of thing doing yeah. that you're so I'm not so this is why I thought earlier it was interesting that you were attacking the government's moves, but in fact they can be seen as, as sort of, um, moving towards an easier relation supply. But anyway, um well, I share those views. Uh, just, just a few points on the on the product. I think it's very important as I say to brand. Uh, a product, uh, but as, as Roger says, it's very difficult to have a product which, which can address uh, various population, and this is what we, we're trying to do in setting up our product, uh, uh, but uh, I think it's about being flexible, being offering uh, uh, as much as possible uh, a kind of shopping list of services, concierge, or uh, uh, fitness, or, or rooms, that, and you pick and choose according to the location you are and, and the people you are targeting. If you take uh, the example of Archstone in Boston, it's a bit different because it's, it's top of the market in terms of private rent, and uh, they are offering uh, tons of services, uh, and I don't think this, uh, uh, all those services can be offered at present uh, uh, to the uh, UK market, unless you are in very central London and you you're developing such a thing because they are located mostly in the city center of Boston, so uh, it's probably a bit different. Uh, next question. So I have to, I'm going to take one to confront 14 people who haven't spoken yet. I'm um, sorry, to the lady of glasses. Louisa Darren from Resolution Foundation. Um, I think the private rental sector is going to have to increase over the next couple of years, in particular to meet the needs of low to middle income households, people who work on low wages, who are shut out of home ownership for the long term. Um, I think build to that is going to be really important to meet the scale of demand that's going to arise. And I, I share the optimism, optimism that the lady at the back expressed. Um, the conversations we've had you know, suggest that institutions are interested but the sticking points are land, which doesn't necessarily need to be given as a subsidy, but it maybe as an equity stake. Um, and also Section 106 requirements, which, which might not need to be removed entirely, but um, be a little bit more flexible. So I think where local authorities are open to new ways of working, they can um, house the group of people that we're looking to house. Uh, if uh, this gentleman has with the pen, uh, Uh, Ian Potter from the Association of Residential Lending Agents. Uh, I've had a, potentially a few comments that could have made the whole way along the line here today because it's a very interesting debate that obviously affects us. Uh, but the, the comment from my friend on the right hand side here yes, of course, you're going to get more complaints about the private rented sector because the homeowners have somewhere to go. They're likely to be affected by a mortgage and it's likely to have been missold and therefore they can go to the FSA uh, with a complaint. And if you're living in the social rented sector, again, there's an ombudsman that can deal with complaints. The problem with the private rented sector is that there is nowhere for them to go other than to people like you and us, who are acting uh, effectively as ombudsmen in one way or another on a voluntary basis and trying to resolve problems. And, and that, that is one of the problems that does surround uh, the private rented sector. I don't have any doubt about that at all. But we were speaking earlier on and hearing earlier on about the, the flat developments and, and too many flats being built and that was really as a result of local planning issues because they were desperate to get properties built within their own area and it was attractive to a developer to build a block of flats which he could get a bigger profit on. It satisfied their financial model at the time, they needed to get the turnover on huge borrowings and one of the challenges going forward is actually going to be how 
the majority of house builders can actually finance the market if the market starts moving and there is a demand through freeing up of planning uh, going forward. Because the majority of them are still fairly heavily borrowed under their banking covenant. If you go back to your uh, question about first time buyers and their ability to afford the deposit, my generation will all remember that if you didn't have a relationship with a financial institution, you couldn't get a mortgage. And at best, you could get 75% mortgage. And you'd mortgage insurance guarantee premiums to find out of your own investment uh, to, to get to that. But there has been a change in lifestyle between my generation and with respect to your generation. We saved to get a mortgage and we didn't have a social life and we didn't trail around the world. And I fully understand why a lot of the younger people want to do that. My own children wanted to do that. But the only way that they could then go on the housing ladder was the bank of mum and dad. Sorry, um, I'll let Matt respond to you. <laughs> I, mean, I, I might add just very quickly, the interesting point on, on the flats, I think a lot of that was due to uh, sort of planning guidance, which also required high density, which also said you must have a certain amount of social housing, which meant that the only profit viable development was flat for you, but I'm But I'll let Matt respond to the point that we have to yeah, understand this one to travel around the world. Right? IPods, it's always iPods I'm buying. It's really, but I've been saying for 12 years to get a deposit. And the major difference is that when you bought a house, you had a financial system which would only lend you two and a half income, which therefore, um, and you also had a government which was building a lot of houses and selling off a lot of council houses, so you had a lot of supply. And you, had a limit, <laughs> and you had a very, very limited mortgage market. But my situation, uh, where's the market supply, is pretty pathetic. Um, and the, you have a liberalised mortgage market in which you can borrow uh, excessive amounts. You have other investment actors which weren't uh, competing with you. Um, and that's and prices have gone through the roof. On, on every level, <coughs> first time buyers are taking on more debt, and prices are higher than they've ever been. Um, so I, I just think the lifestyle argument is, you know, is a, is a red herring for people who don't understand the issue. I have to say, I like to continue finding interesting that a quarter, at the moment, again, I'll repeat because I find it fascinating to say a quarter of the mortgage market is currently supported by 200 billion through the special liquidity scheme and over 100 billion through the credit guarantee scheme. So out of the mortgage market, and that was support has been progressively withdrawn over the next three years. So I think one of the issues around demand, as long as the government doesn't do anything wrong, insane and stuff, like fear in the mortgage market, then I think some of that maybe some of this may begin to ease itself. But um, the gentleman uh, with the beard, who was also outraged <laughs> by... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, just backing up your point on the my generation versus your generation, I mean, there was one other very simple thing, and that is actually the amount of deposit at that 25% equal was actually affordable as about a year's income, whereas now it's what, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years income. So the ability to save that money was very, very much easier in my day than it certainly is today. So I would slightly disagree on that point. It depends where in the country you're wanting to buy. I, I do have to say, as, as the chair, and knowing all the figures, I think in the 1950s the average home was about two times, two and a bit times the average income, and it's now five or six times. However, interest rates were different in those days, inflation was different. I was talking about the deposit. I mean, my, to, in my view, to get the overall picture in terms of the housing market, we've got two things to do. One is to increase the supply, and the other is to find a finance solution for home ownership. And I think those both things need to go together, and I think those are the things that will stabilise the market. PRSI has been an attempt to increase the supply, but it focused on the developers' needs and not on the investors' needs. And what basically happened is the developers drove it, the developers were very much profit, orientated, understandably so, whereas an investor takes a different approach, they take a much longer term approach, they look at the different yield levels, so the key delivery from an investor is what yield can I get and how can I secure that yield. On the short term AST model of supply that we currently have, the yields are eroded by the actual voids, maintenance, repairs and everything else that goes with it. So the problem from an investor's perspective is PRSI is just not attractive. So in order to generate supply through that, it's a very, very limited opportunity. And I think the fact that the PRSI has had so much promotion behind it and government support behind it and has ultimately been quite unsuccessful in terms of delivering that supply, we have to look at a different model. On, this, on the element of home ownership finance, the problem we have there is the only option available to people is mortgages. And we have a mentality that part of the buying of a home is based on a mortgage. When you get a market as we have at the moment, which is completely restricted in its mortgage supply, 
and actually has been for a number of years. It's just been covered up by this sort of 95, 100% drive. But underneath it, the ability and the access to mortgages has been very, very difficult. Right? Um, we again need to find a different model of financing home ownership. And I actually believe there are different models out there which actually bridge renting and buying. And those are the type of models we should be looking at. Funny enough, the government did start to do that on the lower cost housing elements in terms of shared equity. And inside there, to me, lies the market answer, which is on any level, be that 106 housing or actual pure commercial housing. There's a big solution that at the moment I think is being overlooked. And what we're stuck in is an old fashioned view of the housing market. And what we're not doing is finding a new solution to the housing market. Do you think those models would work with or without the, um, so even the most affordable housing had basically a grant element to it, it wasn't unsubsidised? Part, well, part of the problem on the, on the social housing side is that it's been sold as an own your own home property to a group of people who actually don't necessarily want to own their own homes. What they want is some form of secure housing. And the wrong type of people were put into um, shared ownership with no opportunity or very little opportunity of getting the increase in salaries over time to be able to buy more and staircase their way into full ownership and found themselves stuck, as the Roundtree Foundation amongst others identified, in a, in a property that quite honestly wish they hadn't started, they'd gone into the rented market and were able to move around where the jobs are. So they wanted more flexibility rather than less. So it was, mis in a sense, in my opinion, missold. I think that well, uh, Do you want to just briefly respond to that? Was, uh, yeah. yeah. Because I think the, the, share, the share of the equity situation uh, has been an unfortunate experience for a lot of people that have gone into it because the bulk of those schemes uh, were operating when, when the market was at its peak. And an awful lot of the young people that bought into these schemes are today sitting with negative equity and can't set ladder up. Uh, I mean, I have personal experiences of that uh, in the development that I live in. That I know that very, very few of the people have been able to increase their equity stake for the fact that they're actually sitting on, in some cases, up to 30% negative equity on where they purchase. So but the major point is, is I did sorry. also say that it's that we need a new model of financing home ownership and mortgages is not the answer because of negative equity. Uh, I think that's one last point from um, yeah, Rima. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rebecca, you're from the just a point about shared ownership and shared equity mortgages, having worked in that sector, the Housing Association usually takes on responsibility for the negative equity, so it's not really very often the case that the owners experience any negative equity themselves. It is if they want to step ladder up and own more of the, shared, more of the property. Um, I, I, they can I, think still do that. I think shared uh, housing may be a certain set, but one day we'll have a seminar on that whole thing. <laughs> 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 but um, if I can just say thank you to everyone for attending and sure. thank you for our panel. Uh, I hope you found it informative. I thought it was very interesting. And um, this is the first of a series of events that Positive Change is doing on housing. Uh, we've got five line, uh, sorry, four lined up here at the moment uh, one in March, uh, one in April, and one in May. The next one will be on what is the purpose of social housing. So a nice, another nice broad topic that we can have a big debate on. Well, just quickly, uh, we've got a paper on the fundamental sector outlining. Alex wouldn't let me do any graphs, so... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>